Welcome everybody to the first installment of Water Talks. So we're gonna do something a little bit different this afternoon that we've done in the past, and we're gonna do kind of a TED style talk situation. So how many are familiar with TED Talks? Oh good, so you know they're kind of quick, kind of fast, kind of short, hopefully inspiring, hopefully uh, innovative little talks for you, and we're gonna kind of just run straight through some folks we're not really going to take breaks between the speakers. We're gonna to try to make this as seamless as possible. All right, welcome to the stage, Della Fay, to start things off. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. You guys all doing well? We're going to talk about some key reasons to always do well key reasons to always do well. Because everything we do not only affects us, but it affects others too. So that's why I believe we should always do things well. I am reminded of a story, a very fascinating story I heard about a young girl, young girl named Anne Marie Martin and Hans Bergen. Why is that story so important to me? Because you see, Anne Marie gave a smile, just a smile to Hans. Why was that important? You see, Hans was considered the ugliest person in the village. He was so ugly, people would just make faces at him. But Anne Marie, she smiled at him one day. So when Hans died, he left $40,000 to Anne Marie. Anne was surprised, like, why did he leave money to me? What would make him leave that money? He left it, his will said, because Anne Marie smiled at him. The only smile he had his entire life. You see, Anne may have been one person to the world, but to Hans, she was the world. You see, she noticed that this was a lonely individual, only a smile. You see, everything we do can affect others too. So always do well. I know a lot of us have loved that movie, The Titanic. I'm always asking people, what do you think happened? And they were like, remember, they were so arrogant, the guy was so arrogant, nothing can happen to this ship, this Titanic. And I said, that's not really what happened. You see what happened? How many people here have ever gotten up and said, oh, I got up on the wrong side of the bed today. I don't feel good. They just didn't feel like doing the right thing that day. And so the Titanic, if you study and read the story, you will learn that there was a cranky old operator. He probably got up on the wrong side of the bed that day and he was warned, not once, not twice, not three times, but six times he was warned that there was danger up ahead. He was warned that there was ice and that there was an iceberg, but he didn't listen. Matter of fact, he told them, shut up, shut up. When they tried to help him, he told them, shut up. I'm already working on something. And then he turned off that radio. You see, what was important to him was to bring your messages to you, but his not doing well that day, he probably should have stayed in the bed. It cost thousands of lives, right? And that not only affected those lives, but their family members' lives. So that's another reason I say we should always do well. This is a own, my own personal story, something that I went through. I worked for a major transportation company and I was part of the business development department. New business, we gotta bring new business into the company. Oh yeah, we went out and brought new business in. We bid it on proposals. We won those contracts, major contracts. They would take the contract to the CEO. He would have to sign it. And then at the end of that, a lot of people would come to my desk 
some of the managers that reported to my boss. I worked for the head of the department. And they would come and say, we left too much money on the table. We underbid that contract. And I would say, well, why didn't you say that to the boss? Why didn't you say that to the CEO before he signed? You let him sign it. And then all of a sudden, we start losing a lot of money. And the CEO said, we have to get out of some of these contracts. We had to pay like $900,000, $750,000 to get out of those contracts. So guess what happened one day? Because these people decided not to say anything. They told me, Della, you never go over the boss's head. Even if that meant doing the wrong thing and not doing well, I couldn't understand it. Well, when the big CEO came to our department one day and told 10 people, here's your pink slip, let 10 people go, I cried. One man cried, he was so bitter. Why was he bitter? He had reason to be. He had just had a brand new baby. He had just bought a brand new house. His wife wasn't working. And so now he found himself out of a job, all because they didn't do well. You see, everything we do affects others too. I needed to change my cell phone. So I went into the retailer one evening and the young clerk there said, ah, 10 minutes to six, 10 minutes to six. You got 10 minutes and you're coming in here with only 10 minutes left? You don't even know what I need. You don't even want to listen. You're just telling me 10 minutes. Maybe what I wanted to do would only take you two minutes. But you're telling me 10 minutes. I said, well, it's obvious this is not your company, but I want you to know this. Even though this is not your company, that's how you get a paycheck. That's how you meet your obligations. What obligations? You like to pay your rent, you want to pay your car note, you want to pay your mortgage, you want to wear your nice fancy clothes, you may want to take a vacation, you may want to pay for your kids to go to college. I don't know what it is you want to do, but I truly believe that we get to always do well. Always. You just got to make a choice that I'm going to do well because what I do can affect others too. So my thing to that young man was this. If the company folded tomorrow or closed, you would be upset. You would be without a job and you'd want to blame them. You see, because I'm a good listener. You'd want to blame them, but it was you that said 10 minutes to six. You got 10 minutes. I had a girlfriend and we were talking one night. I said, is work something you get to do or is work something you have to do? She said, something I have to do? I said, no, work is not something we have to do. Work is something we get to do. Is that right? I can tell you it is because I traveled for a major corporation all over the country. I was a corporate trainer and in every major downtown city, Miami, Philadelphia, I would always see homeless people. That's why I know work is something we get to do, we don't have to do. Because I told myself, I don't have to go to work. I don't have to have all these fancy clothes. I don't have to do that. That's why work is something we get to do. Because we made a decision that we want a car, we want to drive all these fancy cars and have homes and do all of that. So work is something we get to do. That's why I say every day when you get up, you ought to shout. Remember that song, shout, make me wanna shout. Yeah, makes you want to shout because you know you're getting to pay whatever bills you want to pay, your obligations, you're taking care of everything you need to take care of. So work is something we get to do, not something we have to do. And we get to do it and do it well. Those are some of the reasons. J.K. Rollins said that we do not need a magic wand to change anything. All the power we need is right here within us, right? It's all right here within us. So I wanna say to you guys today, on behalf of humankind, you are extra special people. That's why the extra gum is there. You're extra special and you make mounds of difference in so many people's lives. So I encourage you, that every time you think about doing something to make a decision to always do well.
Hi, I'm Tom Gooch with the engineering firm Fries and Nichols, and I've been asked to talk about the history of water supply in North Texas. Mishner had it right when he said that water, not oil, is the lifeblood of Texas. W.T. Wagner put it a little more colorfully when he struck oil in his ranch near Electra. I wanted water and they got me oil. I was mad, mad clean through. I said, damn the oil, I want water. What he wanted was a nice flowing artesian well, like this one near Forney in the 1800s. He got oil instead. He may do though. If you showed the people who lived in this area 200 years ago, this picture, the Indians would say, well, what's with all the funky colors? Because they didn't know anything about false infrared imagery. But you, once you'd explained all that to, you, to them and gave them what this meant, they'd said, all right, where'd all these people come from? Because the lavender in the image is urban areas. And the second they say is, what's with all the water? Because none of the reservoirs that are so prominent in this picture existed 200 years ago, or even 110 years ago. The early Native Americans and settlers in this area got their water from springs and streams. This is a figure from Gunnar Bruns, Springs of Texas, and it shows springs in the North Texas area. There's lots of them. The largest ones, shown by the orange triangles, are between 3 and 28 CFS flow in water. The, all the others are smaller. The early Americans that lived here got their water from that source. The GM Sargent, talking about supplies for the original Ford in Fort Worth, said this about what happened in 1849. The next morning, after a ride of 10 miles, they came to a high bluff overlooking the Trinity River. At the foot of the bluff was cold, clear spring water. This spot had been used as a campsite by the Indians for many years. The spring water furnished water throughout all seasons. Its supply did not fail when the river was reduced to stagnant pools in the hot summers. This spring served the early settlers as well as the troops and was known as Cold Spring. When the town grew up into a city, many wells were sunk in the vicinity and the spring's location was lost. Most communities in this area in those days were established around some reliable source of water like that. In fact, this area was one of the prime areas in the state for artesian conditions. Artesian conditions is a condition where if you sink a well into an aquifer, it actually flows at the surface of the earth without pumping. The Trinity Sands, as they were called then, or the Trinity Aquifer, as we call it now, was artesian under natural conditions. The water recharge up in higher land to the west went under confining formations as it came down here. And when you got to Dallas-Fort Worth area, if you put a well in, it would flow. And that was a prominent source of water supply. This is a postcard of the Dallas City Hall. In the lower right corner of that postcard, there's a well. And here's a picture of that well at a larger scale. It's not the greatest quality picture, but this is what Justin Kimball said about that in a book called Our City Dallas, written in 1927. In 1890, a well was dug on the courthouse square and struck a gusher at 800 feet, with a flow estimated at 1 million gallons per day. It came to the surface by an 8 and 1 half inch pipe and rose to a height 42 feet above the ground level. Well, that well is still located at the Dallas courthouse. It doesn't flow anymore, and we're going to talk about why that might be. Well, why aren't we using this great artesian water supply for our area now? Well, one answer is people. In 1850, this area had 17,000 people. By 1900, there were nearly 600,000. And a water supply that's perfectly adequate for 17,000 people may not meet the needs of 600,000. <clears> the population went up and the flow from these artesian wells went down. As more and more wells were put in to 
to provide water for more and more people. They relieved the pressure on the aquifer. The artesian flow stopped. By 1891 in Dallas, there was decreased flow with multiple wells. In 1894 in Fort Worth, out of 240 artesian wells in the area, three or four were still flowing. People started digging pits. They started pumping the water to the surface. Between 1870 and 1890, Fort Worth went from 500 people to 23,000. Dallas went from 3,000 people to 38,000. As those people came, they put more and more stress on the water supply. It's no coincidence that during that period, in the early 1880s, both Dallas and Fort Worth brought out, bought out struggling private water supply companies and established a municipal supply company to try to get a better water supply for the future. This is an interesting map. It shows groundwater level declines all across the state of Texas. The uh, colors indicate different l losses in aquifer pre pressure, different groundwater declines. The largest ones are in the Trinity Sands, especially in the Dallas, Fort Worth, and Waco metropolitan areas where water levels since the early 1800s have gone down over 800 feet. Well, by 1910, the population of the area was approaching 700,000 people, and both Dallas and Fort Worth in the 1910s decided to establish surface water supplies to try to get a reliable water supply. Fort Worth had been using water from the Clear Fork of the Trinity, supplemented by wells. Dallas had a system that diverted water from the Trinity, which meant they were using wastewater from Fort Worth and the Fort Worth slaughterhouses, and they decided to get away from that. Fort Worth built Lake Worth, which was completed in 1914. This is a picture of the construction of Lake Worth. Dallas built White Rock Lake, which was completed in 1911, and both built treatment plants to treat these new surface water supplies. So, getting back to our image, in 1920, there were two lakes in this area, two small ones, White Rock and Lake Worth. Between 1920, 1914, and 1950, three more lakes were built. Eagle Mountain, Bridgeport, and Lake Dallas, which is now underwater. It's been flooded out by Lake Louisville. It was a small lake in that same area. Between 1950 and 1970, there were seven more lakes, some of the major lakes in the area built to provide water supply. And then between 1970 and 1987, three more large lakes were completed in the area. And at this point, by 1987, we pretty much developed all the water supplies that you could develop for surface water in the Upper Trinity watershed. So the next step to continue, as a population continued to grow was to go elsewhere looking for water. This is another look at the, kind of the same phenomenon. The blue line on this graph represents per person water supply storage, reservoir storage, in Texas. It takes the total water supply storage that existed at a given time, divided by the number of people. It's running from 1910 to 2010. And from 1910 to about 1975, the amount of storage per person was growing over time. We were developing surface water supplies. And then from 1975 on, the population has been growing faster than our, than our water supply storage, so the per capita storage has been going down. Another way you can look at it is say, during the first half of the 20th century to about 1950, we were an urbanizing state developing some water supply. 1950, there was a big drought. So from the mid 50s until about the mid 80s, we were in a response to drought, building a lot of water supplies and our population was still growing. And then from the mid 80s on, we haven't built very many reservoirs. We've instead been in a period where we're trying to optimize our existing surface supplies and make better use of them. Well, our population growth in this area, in North Texas, didn't stop at 600,000 people in 1900, but instead grew till it's now over 7 million people. And as we developed all the surface supplies that were available in the Upper Trinity watershed, we started to bring in water from other places. And these are some of the ex other watersheds that we're bringing water from now. If you look at the plans that area water suppliers have, there's gonna be a lot more of that in the future. 
Some of that's already underway now, and others is under in the planning stage. In addition to developing water from distant sources and bringing it back, we're making better use of the resources in this area. As you had the population growth, and you had more and more water supply used in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, you also got more and more wastewater flow. By the mid-1900s, the Trinity River downstream from Dallas-Fort Worth was not a pleasant place to be. Then we had federal environmental laws come along. This is a plot that was developed by the Trinity River Authority, and it shows the blue line is the total wastewater discharge from the Dallas-Fort Worth area from 1970 to about 2005, increasing flow going into the river. The red line is the millions of kilograms of biochemical oxygen demand that was contained in that wastewater. Basically, that's a representation of pollution. So even though our flow has been increasing, we've been treating it more and more effectively, and the actual pollution going into the river has been going down over that same period of time. The results have been very positive. The Trinity River downstream from Dallas-Fort Worth is a great place to be. It's also been good for us because in addition to bringing water from distant sources and developing the sources we have here, we've started to reuse treated wastewater. It's become a water supply. Both North Texas Municipal Water District and Tarrant Regional Water District have major reuse supply projects. They're a big part of supply in this area. And there are dozens of smaller projects by other entities supplying golf courses, power plants, municipal water. And then the last source of supply that we've developed in this area is conservation. The state of Texas got serious about water conservation in the late 1980s. And some, from about 2000 until now, we've had huge advances in water conservation in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Our per person use has declined. Of course, that's what we're here to talk about today. But uh, there have really been two things that have happened in that period. One has been increased efficiency of indoor water use with low flow toilets and other water, low water use appliances like clothes washers and dishwashers. And then we've also improved our habits for outdoor water use by regulations, by education, so we're more efficient in the use of water. So that's my quick story about water supply in North Texas. And there's a lot more you could go into that's interesting to talk about. The institutional arrangements we've developed over the years, uh, the, some of the colorful personalities that have been involved in all that, and the future, what's going to come. But I'm out of time, and I'm going to step down. Hello. I am Brooke Goggins. I'm going to talk to you about a very large um, subject, communications, but I'm going to shrink it down um, just a little bit and talk about communications, advocacy, and social media. I'm going to start off with a little video. And, oops, here we go. I'm going to start off with a little video here. Here we go. One of my favorite shows. Nutriums energy bars are just extremely unhealthy for you. What's so bad about corn syrup? It's natural. Corn's a fruit. Syrup comes from a bush. Oh, boy. I think we ought to throw those bars out and eat ham and mayonnaise sandwiches. That's not a good idea. Ham and mayonnaise. Not, no, ham and mayonnaise. No, no, no. Ham and mayonnaise. Ham and mayonnaise. I can't believe you do this every yeah. week. My cat, Turnip, was the greatest cat ever. And I'd like to put his ashes in the time capsule. There will be no human or feline ashes in either one of the time capsules. Except for turnip except for turnip no chanting recommendations for new games at the rec center my daughter loves shoots and ladders oh come on there is no strategy to shoots and ladders it's just luck my daughter's five well your daughter is an idiot her daughter is an idiot her daughter is an idiot oh. no. her daughter no, is an idiot no no she's not so this for those of you who have experienced public meetings. Oh, let me get back to. Some of them get off the rails a little bit like that, and they tend to be uncomfortable and you feel a little bit unprepared. Let's see, where am I? I'm in here somewhere. Here we go, we can go to the next one, there we go. 
So how do we avoid that feeling of being unprepared? Well, there, with the advent of this new thing, social media, we can start to use social media as a tool to get to know our audience. First, it was something where people used it to make friends, they used it as the daily me, where you would update folks on what you were doing. Um, then people used it for dating. And then businesses got on board and started saying, follow us on Facebook. And then now we're seeing social media being used in advocacy. And this is where public entities and public affairs, elected officials and so on are starting to use social media as a tool. But how far can social media really go? So let's take a look at, this is the Citizens Water Advocacy Group. I just pulled this out of um, a quick Facebook search. So if you do have anything to do with them, maybe you can take these tips back. But I think this is in uh, Prescott, Arizona. So these folks have a very general advocacy Facebook page. I'm gonna let you know when my public meetings are, maybe I'll do a couple of employee highlights. But what they see here is, look, 730 people like our page. So that probably means 730 people are paying attention. But how do we know? So here's this, this notice for their public meeting or their city council meeting where they're going to be on the agenda. Nobody's liked, nobody's commented, nobody's shared. Okay, that, they may think nobody's gonna show up. But what we now have and what technology has brought us is a way to look a little bit deeper where it's no longer just the front facing site. So here's a dashboard that our company has created where you can take a look and you see who's shared my content, who's liked my content, who's engaged with it. Not just what I've created, but those who are associated with it. So what truly is the impact? Who's gonna show up? Are they going to say, my daughter is an idiot, and how do I prepare for those things? So how, how does this event, and how does the, the long tail um, impact of this event compare with other events? Were other people sharing more content at something else? Is it positive or is it negative? Are people adding their own um, unique content where it's show up at this meeting and tell the Citizens Water Advocacy Group were anti their development and I think it was in Bell River. So how does this post compare to other posts and how do we best prepare our people to go in and be prepared? How can they anticipate some questions? What's the subject matter that they need to be prepared to answer? Is it gonna be specifically about that development or is it gonna be about other water advocacy issues and how do we make sure our people are versed on all of that? So Facebook can be a real tool and if you are on Facebook, you'll see if you like or comment or share anything that is about um, an elected official or something political in nature. Facebook now um, has a feature called uh, town halls where a public entity can do a Facebook Live like we're doing now. They can do a town hall and your entity will get an Excel spreadsheet at the end of that event which will show you everyone who engaged with that piece of content. Did they like it? Did they share it? Did they comment it on it? And then further, what we can do is take a look at where are those people living? So for example, I had a, a client who is a large railroad client, not here, um, back east, and they were doing a project in Idaho. And that project was getting a lot of negative feedback on social media. There was a lot of negative um, commenting, a lot of sharing negative articles from things that had happened in other places. Well, that was fueling the fire of those local residents in that local community. But what we found out when we looked a little bit deeper into the social media data was the people that were providing all of that negative sentiment were actually located in Kansas. So what you can do is go when you're preparing for that public meeting you can go into that public meeting and say i understand that john smith has been feeding you all a lot of negative information about our brand but john smith lives in kansas so you start to you mitigate those issues before they start so let's take a quick look at twitter i know this is hard to see but this is back at the citizens water advocacy group 
So they do not have a Twitter handle, but yet when I did a quick search, um, here's all the folks, this was just a screenshot, but this is all the folks that are talking about them. So here's seven entities that are talking about them. There's a resident, there's a media group, there's another advocacy group, there is um, someone who's on the board of their local water board, but yet they don't know what these folks are saying about them. They're not a part of this conversation. So I'm already unprepared. I, already, I don't know what to be answering. I don't know through my social media channels, because if you go through these things and you see there's something positive, there's something negative, you can have those conversations, you can take them offline, you can direct message them, you can start to, again, mitigate some of the issues before you go and actually do a public meeting. So what's the long tail of the impact of this Twitter conversation that they're not in? Well, again, we can take a look at the dashboard and see, okay, there was five unique tweets about this issue. 11 folks retweeted it or shared it among their friends. So their friends see it, and then they share it, and then they share it, and then you start to see, okay, well, what's the sphere of influence that these folks actually have around my issue? Well, if you're not here, you don't know. If you don't see the content that's getting the most shares, you don't know. So how do I know how to populate my social media channels with information that's positive, things that people are wanting to hear about? Because when we're talking about public entities and when they, as they relate to social media, I'm a big believer in, in the off season, you're, you're building advocates. So you're, in, you're depositing in the bank before you actually need folks to get out and vote, whether it's on a bond election or have some baseline understanding of what your entity does. So when you see the content that's resonating with folks, it's, you start to determine we're going to bookend a piece of educational information with two pieces of recreation information because the recreation information is what most people are engaging with. But what we want them to know is that our entity does X, Y, and Z, and these are, this is our mission statement. So you start to figure out the art um, because social media, I, I believe, is both art and science, especially when it comes to advocacy. So you start to figure out how you best build your content pipeline. You start to flag those folks that are truly advocates of your brand and those who actually have a big sphere of influence. Are they neighborhood association presidents? Are they school board volunteers? Um, do they have the credibility to go out and be an advocate for your brand and further bring people to the polls or get folks to testify? But it's here in social media where you're having a 24-7 uh, public meeting. You're going to get more answers more accurately than, say, if you were to do a poll. If somebody was going to call your cell phone, which we all love, getting those calls at 6 p.m. when we're trying to do dinner and tub and pack lunches for the next day, and they want to hear what your feelings are about a development happening two roads over. Well, you're probably not going to do that, but after the kids are in bed and the lunches are packed and you have a moment to exhale, you're going to go on media, social media, perhaps, and share some information about a public meeting that's happening as it relates to a street in front of your house. And you're going to share something or you're going to say, you know, I've had it with this at City of Arlington. But if they called, I don't have time. So you're going to get more accurate information from people who are actually affected by your project or your brand and who you want, as I said, to come out and be supportive, vote on your bond package. Um, and so it's all a matter of, I, I think when, you when you're talking about um, social media and having to educate folks on what you do, which, you know, we're not, if we're in a public entity, we're not Taco Bell or we're not, you know, a, a movie or a celebrity, and so sometimes our content isn't as sexy as it can be. So we want to make sure that we're giving folks something where they're engaged with our brand and they're feeling a bit of reciprocity. So we give them a little bit 
of education, of fun, of information, and then we get some attention. We build some brand loyalty. So social media is absolutely a tool that um, public entities can start to build advocates, and your public meetings may end up like this. Good afternoon. When I, uh, when I think of the importance of access to safe water, I often recall the smile of this young mother, Maria Eugenia. She would tote her little baby on her back, which is typical of the Aymara women in the Bolivian Andes. And she'd tell me this story before we were able to help her and the other 130 families in their community of Anchayani, how they actually still had access to water, but it was just in the main plaza there. And she'd tell the story to me while smiling, which always threw me off, but she'd say, hermano, there was enough water there for all the families. We figured out as a community there was enough water there for five gallons per family per day. But sometimes the springs didn't produce as well, so we'd get there early. We'd get there so early, hermano, she'd say, we'd get there before even the sun came up. She said, we'd have to wait there. And we'd wait there until the sun would come up enough to thaw the water in that pipeline so that water could flow through that tap. So when we had the opportunity to help this community, it was particularly hard hit by lack of water, Anciani. Uh, we went about the same approach that we had done in dozens of other communities in the Bolivian Andes. And it was a beautiful thing because the community, to have this opportunity to achieve this dream of safe water in their homes would really rally. Each family benefiting would participate in surveying, helping lay out where we're gonna run the water lines. They'd help identify potential water sources. And they would also give up to two or three weeks of their own labor, unpaid. We call that the sweat equity. But they'd also give financial contributions. And I'd like us all to pause for a second and think of our last paycheck, perhaps for two weeks of work. And then hand that amount of money over to help achieve water for your family. That's what these folks would do. Now granted, they would make a dollar or two dollars a day, but it's that kind of level of sacrifice. And in the end, they, it wasn't seen as a handout. They were participants, they were owners, and they would take care of these systems. Typically, they would be spring-fed, gravity-driven systems with a little concrete tap like that and the yards. Where there weren't springs, our Bolivian partners, who continue to this day, a group of young Bolivian water work specialists, uh, Suma Haima, would build these hand pumps from scratch. And the benefiting families would dig the trenches, sometimes 25, 30 foot deep, a one foot or one meter diameter uh, well. Then more recently, we brought up the Suma Haima guys up here to North Texas, had them train up with some good old boys from my hometown area of Munster learned how to drill with drilling mud, learned how to rebuild mud pumps and so forth. And then we eventually shipped this rig down there and they do these deeper wells for some communities that can, that can go that route. But just seeing the joy of having access to safe water, really in the way this changes lives is so amazing. You contrast that with the many people who still don't have access to safe water out there. I won't wait 15 seconds but the statistics say that every 15 seconds, the little one's dying from a lack of access to safe water. Or if you can imagine every hospital bed in the world, over half of those are filled with people who are sick, either from poor sanitation or lack of access to safe water. Taking a step back from Bolivia and looking more at a global perspective for a second, um, the UN is saying that now over 90% of humanity has access to an improved water supply source. And that still leaves about 700 million people without access to water. Um, but I can tell you it wasn't that long ago that the statistics were over a billion people. So we're on the right track. Things are, there's reason for hope. And access to sanitation lags behind. And as you may suspect, the rural remote areas are the ones that typically don't have it. Also, rapidly urbanizing cities, the, the outskirts of those areas will often be struggling as well. Looking just for a second at water availability, uh, this one is quite a cause of concern. It says that over 2 billion people live in countries 
where the water being used exceeds what's considered the renewable fresh water rate, fresh water rate uh, by 25%. And then certain regions, say North Africa, Western Asia, that water mining, as you might say, it exceeds by 60%. So se severe challenges await in certain areas. And many of the technologies being implemented here, the reuse we discussed, this, those are gonna have to be implemented in places like this. Now, there's many needs out there and people I think of goodwill have gone about uh, uh, different approaches to trying to address it. In the case of Bolivia, it just so happened that when my wife and I arrived there in 2000, we went to the Indian, village, uh, Indian Valley city of Cochabamba to learn Spanish. I could barely even say the word water at the time. But looking out, all of a sudden, I've seen thousands of people marching on the city plaza. And it had something to do with water. Being a water engineer at the time, I was quite interested in it. And come to find out, as we got into the details, Cochabamba was like one of so many other cities in the late 90s, early 2000s, that were being pressured to privatize their municipal water services. You know, it's one thing if you choose that to do it, and if you're regulated well, as some countries in Europe have gone the route. When you impose these things on from the outside, they often go sideways on you. In the case of Cochabamba, Bechtel had been awarded a 40-year concession. They were a sole proposer. They had negotiated a 16% profit annually on any investments made. So overnight, to achieve that, water bills went up 50%. You couple that with, all of a sudden, the local cooperatives that had drilled water wells for their local neighborhoods would have to be paying Bechtel for access to the aquifers. And same thing for the local irrigators. And you have your, on your hands a water war. That's what they call this Cochabamba water revolt in 2000. And it actually, after about three or four weeks, the, the central government backed off this. But it wasn't before a protester was shot. Tens of thousands were in the streets. But this is globally, perhaps some of you have even heard of this Cochabamba water revolt, but it was the first of many pushbacks against this privatization. Later it would happen in Buenos Aires, and then again in La Paz del Alto, where I lived in 2005. Another external challenge countries like Bolivia face are the impacts of climate change. La Paz del Alto, we lived on the outskirts of El Alto, about three million people, but we had a semicircle ring of these snow caps, just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and I used to, when I come out of my adobe house, I look up to the right and see the snow caps. And there I could always see was once the world's highest ski slope, Chacataya. But in even the seven short years we lived there, I watched that glacier dwindle down to absolutely nothing, as you see in the bottom right. So you can see the change from 1910 to 2008. Of course, reducing glaciers has much more of an impact than just on recreation. Just two years ago, the second largest lake in Bolivia completely dried up. And with it, a millennial culture, the Uderus, who used to make a, a living off of fishing in that lake, completely gone. Climate change, but also excessive withdrawals from mining, agriculture. A year ago at this time in the capital city of La Paz, they were going through water rationing. Now we've all been through water rationing here. We couldn't water our lawns for maybe once a week or once every two weeks or maybe even a month, depending on where you lived in the Metroplex. Try having water for only three hours every third day. And so that, with these trucks that you see here, is how they got by. Again, the glaciers no longer having any runoff into the reservoirs they had. But when you have a chance to get close to the glaciers and you see this crystalline water coming off of them, it's just absolutely breathtaking. And yet you wonder how, when this is upstream of the human contact, and then when it passes through the city, you see things like this. In fact, in many of the develop, developing countries, it's just a sorry state of condition the surface, water, surface waters are in, whether rivers, streams, lakes. I think this kind of image is what we would have seen maybe in Fort Worth, the Marine Creek downstream of the slaughterhouses, you know, 70, 80, 90 years ago. Another issue is the tailings for mining. mining. In this case in Wanuni, the tailings were being discharged straight into the river 
serious contamination effects. As you can see here from some of the Amata Campesinos livestock, their sheep. The cities and towns I've noticed, I was just back in Bolivia this past July for a short visit. They've done a fairly good job of capturing their sewers and collecting them through sewers. Um, but they've historically been discharging them straight into streams, or in this case, uh, it overflowed into a farmer's pasture. But there's a lot of interest in starting to treat this wastewater. They're starting to get the resources to do something about it. So again, it's not all doom and gloom. There's a lot of, lot of reasons for hope here. This is, uh, I guess, a 3D rendering of what the town of Viacha, 100,000, are looking to do. A simple oxidation ditch, activated sludge system, but something new. And I see a tremendous need here for operator technical exchange. If any of you have worked with wastewater treatment plant operators, if any of you are interested in helping me make three to five minute YouTube videos on basic uh, treatment processes, I would love to be in touch with you because I think there's a real interest across all of Latin America. Many other countries are at this stage now of seeing water as not just something to be discharged, but as something you can reclaim, something that's going to help them meet their future needs. I guess I'll end with one final story. It was from early on in my time there. I went to go visit this rural village water system that had been installed. I think a Peace Corps volunteer had been involved. Now, I casually asked this villager, uh, this gentleman, you know, well, what was life like, you know, before you had water? He paused, he turned and looked back in my eyes. He goes, you know, hermano, sin agua, no hay vida. He goes, without any water, there, there is no life. And surely on his mind were the many little ones in his village who had died before their time. Surely on his mind was the lack of human dignity, of having to draw water out from streams where your own livestock were passing through. But it was something that was so essential, this water, how it brought life back to the community. A true game changer. So thank you very much. Okay, we're all good now. I don't need to start over, do I? Okay, good. So anyway, this is what our manufacturing system looks like today. Very linear. You go from manufact you go from extraction to uh, manufacturing to use to disposal. Very, very linear. But that's a problem. Because of that linear thing, we are taking our natural resources, whether they're renewable or non-renewable, and we're burying them in a hole in the ground. According to the EPA, the United States recycles about 34% of its solid waste. According to this chart, that puts us about number 18 in the world for recycling our garbage. But there's something even more than that that people don't typically think about. They don't think about all of the energy that goes into the manufacturing of the products that we use. That's something called the embodied energy. So when you're throwing something away or burying it in a hole in the ground, you are not only throwing away those natural resources, but you're also burying all of the energy that went into manufacturing that product and all of the water that was used in the manufacturing of that product. For instance, the ubiquitous plastic fork. Everyone's handed one at the 88-year-old birthday party, right? 
Ooh, would you like a piece of cake? I'd love a piece of cake. Ooh, chocolate. Mmm, yum, 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 yum. Yeah, he, she's doing great in school. Can't believe she's eight. It's wonderful. Gosh, this is so good. And into the trash. Gone. That one plastic fork that you enjoyed your cake for about two and a half minutes is gone. It's going to go to the landfill, be buried in a hole in the ground. But what is the embodied energy look like that it was in that plastic fork? Well, you have the drilling of the petroleum, which could be out in the water, it could be on land. You have the drilling for the natural gas that goes into the plastic. And you also have the refining of those materials. All of these are very, very energy intensive processes. Well, then you gotta move those resources from wherever they were taken out um, from the world. So you could put them on a tanker ship. You could put it in a pipeline or trucking it across the United States. All of those processes also require energy. Plus there's the emissions that are associated with that process also. So what are some of the consequences? For instance, we have the um, a house that was damaged from a 5.7 earthquake in Oklahoma from the fracking. It wasn't necessarily the fracking. It was, let me get this right, it was from the injection wells, from depositing the wastewater into the injection wells that was causing the earthquake. So that was some of the damage. In Arkansas, we had a pipeline break, not in the middle of nowhere, but in a neighborhood in Mayflower, Arkansas. And then, uh, to put this globally into context, these uh, African penguins were covered in oil after an oil spill off of Cape Town, South Africa. So that kind of brings that whole global thing into perspective. And then, the water gets contaminated. Whether it's from a petroleum spill, whether it is from the wastewater injection wells from fracking, entering into the groundwater, contaminating that groundwater, it affects the water that we drink because it is a, even though it's a renewable resource, it's all we have. We can't make more water. This is it. Another thing to know is that plastic forks, plastic cutlery is typically made out of either polypropylene or polystyrene. It takes five gallons of water to make one pound of polypropylene and 20 gallons of water to make one pound of polystyrene. And you are gonna eat a piece of cake and throw it in a hole in the ground. Plus you have the chemicals that are added to the plastic that um, add the color, because you gotta have the color coordinated stuff for the birthday party. And then also the chemicals that are added to it for its thermodynamic um, element where it's not gonna melt when you cut, uh, when you eat soup or stir a cup of coffee with it, because that would be bad to ruin a good cup of coffee. And so here we are to the landfill. It's pretty crazy, isn't it? That you can enjoy a piece of cake and have that kind of impact on the planet. So then they're all kind of the students just kind of like, yeah, whatever. But you show them this, they're like, whoa, wait, cell phone? I have one of those. They probably have about three of those tucked into different drawers in their houses. They, you know, they say that uh, you only keep one for about 14 to 18 months and then you replace your cell phone because you gotta have the new one because the marketing because the companies do such a great job marketing those products so this is a chart from the epa it is illustrating that there are nine parts to a cell phone that really have their very own um, life cycle that you can do an analysis of. But we're just gonna do just one little piece of the cell phone. We're gonna do the copper wiring. It's in every single electronic that we own. What kind of embodied energy goes into 
getting that copper out of the earth and putting it into a cell phone. Well, we have the mining, which is energy intensive, plus the trucks um, that run on the diesel. Then we have to smelter, take, send it to a smelter, and then it is manufactured into a copper coil. All very, very energy intensive. Again, we've got to transport that stuff, put it on a, on a container ship, however it's going to get there. But there's also the energy of the, manu the manufacturing process by hand. That's considered energy, the human energy that goes into it. And then you got to charge the sucker every single night. Or the students at my school, they have to charge it many times a day because they are constantly on their phone. The mining process leaves an enormous scar on the planet's face. And it has a lot of consequences downstream. This actually is one of those consequences from the manufacturing process. This is uh, from the article I found called A Dystopian Lake. It is in Baotou, China, where a lot of our rare earth minerals come from that are necessary for all of our electronics and our cell phones. This is the waste from the manufacturing of those rare earth elements that go into um, our electronics. Um, they say that um, to make a 0.07 gram microchip, it takes 60 grams of material to make that chip. So the rest of that is waste, and that's what that looks like. Also to make that chip, it takes five gallons of water just to make one little tiny chip, and that's the waste. What about the water that goes into it? 20 gallons of water go into making that little tiny chip. To make a six inch chip, it takes 20,000, I'm sorry, 2,000 gallons of water that go into a six inch chip. Plus the chemicals, 20 pounds, 20 pounds of chemicals to go into that six inch chip. And then those chemicals sometimes get away from us. One of those pictures is a tailings pond that has leaked into a local river in British Columbia. And then we've all seen pictures of the smog, the pollution in China. That is a chemical reaction. And then if you don't recycle it, where does it go? It goes into a landfill where it is going to be buried forever and ever and ever. But there are some other things we need to consider too. Not just the natural resource side of it, whether it's renewable or non-renewable. There are a lot of social issues that are associated with our electronics. For instance, the extreme housing crisis in China. That is one of the, one of the um, apartment towers um, where people are living in spaces that are only about 12 square feet. Um, the other picture there is from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, notice the beautiful necklace he has on there are um, high caliber bullets. And then the other picture is Foxconn, where the Apple products used to be manufactured in 2010. I guess they still are, but in 2010 there was a problem. And this was the solution to that problem of employees being so stressed out that they were committing suicide and so they, instead of making things better, they put a net around the building so that they would not be successful. This is what mining looks like in the DRC. It's a lot different than it looks like in industrial nations. Um, these are child soldiers. These mines are run by militants and the materials that come out of these mines that go into our electronics are used to fund war throughout Africa. All so we can do that. 
This is what I see when I walk through my campus every day. I don't see anybody's faces. I know students by the tops of their heads as I walk down the hall. This chart says that there are 4.77 billion cell phones in use right now in the world. The EPA says that we only recycle 14 to 17% of those cell phones. That means that 80% of the materials that are in those other cell phones are being wasted. And every time we waste a resource like that, we have to go back and have all these other consequences. I know, right? <gasps> it's mind blowing, the amount of resources that we are burying every day. So what do we do? Well, what I'd love to do is ban the plastic fork. Get rid of it, yay UTA, for having real silverware. Yay! Like these people. Another thing I'd like to do is get rid of the linear manufacturing process and instead move toward a circular economy where we are putting materials back into the manufacturing process instead of allowing them to be buried in a hole in the ground. Yeah! So waste reduction. It's not going to solve all the world's problems, but it's a great way to start. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. It's really bright up here. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you today about stories. And I'm going to start with a story that's kind of a personal journey of mine. Um, back in 2003, I was a young mom. And I had a little four-year-old son. And we were going to the movies. And we sat down in the theater. And we were getting ready to start. Um, to see Pixar's movie Finding Nemo. You guys have seen that, right? Um, so fine, we get our popcorn, we settle in, and um, you should also know that in 2003, Sam was four and about to start kindergarten in the fall, and so I spent a lot of time thinking about kindergarten and whether I was making the right decision and if he was going to be okay and if I should send him or hold him back. So all these questions are in the back of my mind, and Nemo starts. And then there's this scene. And Nemo's been lost, and Marlon and Dory have found each other, and they're on this journey, and they find themselves in the belly of a whale. And Nemo's, I mean, Marlon has just given up hope at this point. And he's laying there at the bottom of the whale's belly, and Dory swims down to him and says, You know, oh, are you okay? And he says, No, I'm not okay. I promised him I'd never let anything happen to him. And Dory says, well, that, that's a funny thing to promise. Marlon says, what? And she says, well, you can't never let anything happen to him. Then nothing would ever happen to him. Not much fun for little Harpo. Remember, she has short-term memory loss. So I'm sitting there, and I start to tear up a little bit, and I think, OK. What's the deal? This is an animated kids movie, right? I'm going to be fine. <laughs> and then this next scene happens. And the water starts to shift inside the whale's belly. And Marlon and Dory are clinging on to the whale, trying not to slip to the back of the throat. And Marlon's convinced that back of the throat means easier to swallow you, so get back there. And Dory's saying, no, 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 I'm speaking well, I'm listening to him, he's trying to save us, and Marlon's having none of that. So this is where this very poor video clip with awful resolution starts that I'm about to play for you. But listen to the dialogue. What is going on? I'll check. No, no more way. You can't speak well. Yes, I can. No, you can't. You think you could do these things, but you can't, Nemo! Okay! Doreen! Go! He says it's time to let go! Everything's gonna be alright! How do you know? How do you know something bad isn't gonna happen? I know!
sobbing. I'm completely ugly crying in the theater. I have no tissues. I'm completely unprepared. I'm wiping my nose and eyes on my shirt sleeves. And then I look around, and I'm not really embarrassed because every single parent in the theater is ugly crying too. So that's kind of what I want to talk to you about today. Is That, to me, is the power of story. I remember that story 14 years from then, today, because guess what? Sam, see I'm going to ugly cry for you now, is a senior and he's going to college. It's a little bit bigger deal than kindergarten. <laughs> so when I watch Finding Nemo now, I can't even go into what a line like, it's time to let go, does to me, right? <laughs> So, stories are our universal experience. And I love that I'm here at your symposium all about water because water is that too. But stories have this unique power to bring us together because we all want the same happiness and opportunities and good health for the people that we care about. And it's hard for us all to let go. So the question is, how does this happen and why does this happen? So I'm going to try to answer the why question for you first. So here's the brain. Why do stories have this power to engage us the way we do? A couple of years ago, I was a graduate student here at UTA in the Mind Brain Education Program in the Education Department. And their mission is to look at what we know from cognitive neuroscience and psychology and learn how that can inform us to design better educational experiences for students. So I spent two years doing just that. It turns out that stories are an amazing vehicle for, for just that sort of thing. They engage us on a level that facts and figures alone generally can't. So imagine for a second that you had asked me here today to come to talk to you about Hurricane Harvey. Being in the business that you guys are in, you may have more facts and figures than I do about Hurricane Harvey. But just say I started throwing a laundry list of data at you, like there were some odd 27 trillion gallons of water that fell on Louisiana and Texas in just six days and there were about 130,000 structures flooded in Harris County alone. Or that there were 30,000 estimated people who were displaced and in need of temporary housing. So as I'm talking and telling you that data, we're going to imagine you're all hooked up to an fMRI machine. And your auditory cortex would be lighting up because you're listening to me. And an area called Wernicke's area would be lighting up too because I'm saying words and you use that part of your brain to process words and understand them. And that's great. But if I started to tell you a story about the people who actually suffered devastating loss in Hurricane Harvey, something different would start to happen. Your auditory cortex would still be lighting up because I'm talking to you and Wernicke's area would still be working because I'm saying words, but if I started to talk to you about a family who were, was rescued from the roof of their home by the Cajun Navy, or a group of neighbors who formed a human chain to save a woman from her car that was filling with water, if I started to describe to you how they stood in chest-high cold water as they formed that human chain, your sensory cortex would light up too, just as if you were standing in that cold water. And if I started to go into detail about the little 10-year-old girl who hurled her backpack into the boat right before she swam out to it from her roof, then your motor cortex would start to activate as if you were actually swimming. And if I went on and, and talked about the devastating loss that these people endured at the hand of Hurricane Harvey, your emotional and empathy centers would also be activated. They'd be on fire. And that's kind of where this magic of stories starts to happen. Because there's this amazing research 
um, some of it out of Princeton University, about how our, the brain activity of the storyteller and the story listener actually start to align when the storyteller tells a good story. So this human connect, connection that we feel whenever you experience a good story actually has some neurobiological clout, which is pretty cool and pretty validating. I mean, thank God there's a good reason that I was ugly crying in the theater. So stories really do have this amazing power. There's some research about a group of people at risk for hypertension who were told a story and actually changed their habits for diet and exercise. There's a video about a father and his son struggling with cancer where 100% of viewers donated to related nonprofits after they saw the video. And from my personal experience, I can tell you that after my friend Holly told me about her family being rescued by the Cajun Navy off of their roof, we were in my kitchen the next Saturday putting together care packages for people who'd been displaced and needed temporary housing. That's the power of story. So, how do you tell a good one? My company, Story Stage, um, we spend 100% of our time teaching children ages kindergarten through 12th grade to tell a better story. We think it's really important. Um, there's a lot at stake. When you're little and you're on the playground, you tell a story to your, friend, to your friend to build a relationship. And when you get home from school, your parents want to know the story of your day. Your teachers want you to write a story about something that was scary or a good vacation that you took. And then as you get a little bit older, teachers start to want you to write that down. When you apply to college, they want you to write a personal essay. So we know that the kids who learn to tell stories and to tell them well end up being our better readers and writers. So there's a lot at stake. So how do we do that? How do we teach them? We have these squares that we lay on the floor um, in schools, and we call it our story walk. And so when we start with the kids, the first thing that we tell them is to start from a truth. We want them to create a character, a who, and a where. And when they do that and we say write from a truth, what we mean is write from something you know. And you've probably heard that before. If it matters to you, it's going to matter to everybody else. So in Finding Nemo, they do this through character because the parental relationship is something that is universal to all of us. We understand that. That's our truth. Once you have created your character, we move on to the light bulb icon. And we used a light bulb for this icon because it really is the light that guides your hero through the rest of his story. Everything that your character does, everything that he chooses to do that's good, everything that he chooses to do that may be not so good, is guided by this desire, this motivation, this want. So tell us what he wants. And the stakes kind of have to be a little bit high because you can't just want to find your car keys. It's not going to drive you to the end of your very creative, interesting story. Maybe if you want to find your car keys because your wife is in labor, you might be getting somewhere, but you have to raise the stakes. So once we know what your character's desire is, we need to know what the problem is, what's getting in the way. Fear, doubt, confusion, society, in Nemo, our antagonist comes in the form of some guys in a boat and time and distance and perhaps societal conventions. And this is where we start to see some of our kids get lost because you've created probably more than one character, hopefully more than one character in your story, and they all have a backstory. They all have issues that they're dealing with, like Dory. She's got short-term memory loss. And it would have probably been pretty easy to get derailed and start focusing on that and follow Dory's story. But Nemo um, 
the guys at Pixar are very smart and they made that a separate movie like a couple of years ago, Finding Dory. <laughs> so stick to your hero's story, stick to your hero's problem. This is the second half of our story walk. So here's another sort of stumbling part point for the kids. Once we know the hero's problem, everybody wants to get to the end. And so we hear kids say things like, well, you know, so there's this story about Nemo and um, he was in the ocean. So if we go back, this is the story of Nemo who lived in the ocean, who had this idea, or the story of Marlin who lived in the ocean, who had this idea that he never wanted anything to happen to his son. Nemo. But the problem was Nemo got taken up by some fishermen in a boat and whisked away. And this made Marlin feel devastatingly sad. And then our kids go, you know what? They found Nemo. And if you were in the theater, you would have been there for about 10 minutes and the story would have been over. So what we really want to see, see people do and what really makes a a good dramatic story is to have this hero struggle and to try a few things that don't work first and build up this dramatic tension until you get to the climactic moment. And that's where this magic neural, neural coupling that I was talking about earlier starts to really happen. You build the dramatic tension. You're feeling what the hero is feeling. You're all in. So when I hear a story, when I see a play, when I go to the movies, when I read a book, when I listen to someone tell one and there's not some big exciting moment, I kind of start to wonder, what happened? Did I miss something? Because we all want that big fight or big reveal or big, big escape. So Finding Nemo delivers because Marlin finds Nemo and Marlin is changed in some way. And that's another important part, is that your hero has to change. Have some epiphany, some new insight. And for Marlon, his new insight is that it's okay to let go. For me, when I watch Finding Nemo now, it speaks to me that way because my story is Marlon's story. Our journeys because of my story listener brain and Pixar's amazing storytelling brain are all synced up and I'm feeling what Marlon's feeling and so Sam's going to college and it's okay to let go. So to wrap things up, keys to good storytelling. If you want to change somebody's ideas or perhaps their behavior, tell them a story. Data's great, I love data. But I don't remember a lot of data 14 years later. And when you tell that story, start from a truth. Pick a character about something you care about, something you know about. And don't solve that character's problem too quickly. Take us on the journey. Let us feel that tension. Let that neural coupling start to happen and stick to the pattern. Now what does that mean? Well, our brains love patterns and predictability and that doesn't mean that the story content needs to be predictable because that's a boring story. That's when you change the channel. But the story structure, the story elements that we all have come to expect to be there need to be there. So stick to the pattern. And follow your hero. Don't follow Dory. Follow Nemo. If you started with Nemo, follow Nemo. And finally, I just want to say, um, now that you know a little bit about the power of story, use your story power for good. Because stories can bring us together, but they can also tear us apart. So use your power well and wisely. Thank you.